Um, so Rochelle Pinto teaches English at Azim Premji University, Bangalore, with interest in 19th century land disputes and the relation between ethnography and the colonial novel. She has two books, Between Empires, Print and Politics in Goa, and Translation, Script and Orality, Becoming a Language of State. She was research fellow at the L'Institut de Today's Advances, um, the Nehru Memorial Museum and Library, New Delhi, and CSDS Delhi. She taught English at Delhi University and at CSDS Bangalore, where she co-directed a project, Archive and Access, between 2009 and 2011. Professor Pinto, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Thank you for giving me this opportunity. I have to thank Lynn for introducing me to this forum and Professor Sinfi Makoni for inviting me to speak. I thank Chanel and Phoebe for organizing this and for the effort they've put in. Um, I'll, I think I'll share my, uh, I'll share my screen because I have a few slides that might facilitate, uh, you know, some of what I'm saying. Um, so, yeah. Can, let me uh, maximize this. Okay, is that, can everyone see that? Yes. Okay, okay. So uh, the title of my talk points to a process that is common to languages that are compelled to reflect the symbolism of the nation state so that they may be recognized by it. To a greater or lesser extent, this has been the pressure on European and other languages since the 19th century, when philology and nationalism converged to influence most aspects of literary writing. Language communities in post-colonial states, however, discovered how reliant the cultural symbolism of such new states was on the categories and judgments emanating from colonial philology. So my focus in this talk is firstly on the consequences for communities uh, faced with this phenomenon and the strategies they employ to deal with it. And secondly, I talk about literary production that does not seem to address the status configuration of language and identity and the challenges that that throws up for literary scholars. The editors of the book Doing Conceptual History in Africa note that few languages on the continent actually reproduced the isomorphism of coinciding national and linguistic boundaries. Um, but in post-independent India, in contrast, as an attempt to recognize and contain linguistic diversity within a federal structure, states were formed on a linguistic basis, reinforcing the expectation of a single dominant language linking a majoritarian ethnicity and territory. In India, the transformation of epistemic expectation to practice was made possible by the extraordinary power enjoyed by colonial philology. A feature that defines the self-construction of dominant castes in India during and after colonial rule is the reliance on a tradition of literary writing as a representative of antiquity and a high culture. It achieved visibility as colonial philology converged with and transformed upper caste self-conceptions. So from the 19th century on, the idea of continuous linear histories that present territory, community, and writing as symmetrical and overlapping concepts, hierarchized languages in relation to each other, and the evidence of ancient texts endowed some literatures and communities associated with them with the valued attribute of a long history. And this is one reason why the Indian subcontinent successfully produces instances where epistemic expectations are fulfilled in policy. So while the historicity of language became a fundamental component of modern philological analysis, the legacy of Indology and Orientalism added classicism as a cultural value, and the appearance of epic texts became a point of civilizational origin. We could also call this particular burden of literary history in India as, of, as official regional literati refract this model across the states, looking for a classical tradition that configures literary history and dominant cultural symbols for each linguistic community across uh, wherever it's possible. So we see that a constellation of expectations emerging from this period has shaped the concept of languages as singular individuated entities, which of course is shared across, uh, uh, I think every other uh, post-colonial space, each separate from the other 
with an evolutionary history that implied development over time from speech to writing, from simple to complex forms. This position Sanskrit and the foundational epics associated with it as a normative beginning for all literary history in India. So the self-narrative of upper castes is then naturalized to the rest of the nation. It is unsurprising then that by the mid 20th century, recognition from national literary organizations that technically have autonomy from state policy became a condition for languages to be able to earn state acceptance. Language communities were expected to provide evidence of literary texts from antiquity and being recognized as a literary language became a rite of passage to eventually getting state recognition and becoming an official language of the country. The privileging of Sanskrit as a point of origin has created what appear to be abstract universal expectations of literary history in India, but are in fact modeled on dominant histories of Sanskrit. Uh, the Sanskrit scholar Sheldon Pollock has drawn attention to two moments in the history of writing. The moment when a language is written, which he calls its literization, and literarization when it is used in a literary text. This is also the moment, Pollock argues, when a language is named as an objective entity. Pollock has been criticized for reproducing a dominant culture's self-representation as a norm, but the reason I detail this distinction between the moment of origin of writing, literary writing and naming, is because it illuminates the crisis of a language that deviated from the national model. I focus on the predicament of the Konkani language, which is spoken down the Western coast of India. So this is, I've just, uh, you know, this is a map of the Western coast and that star with uh, Panaji is uh, where, where Goa is situated. But uh, Konkani is spoken by communities all down the coast. So Konkani speaking communities are housed in different states that have other Indian languages as their official language, all except the state of Goa, where Konkani is the official language. I begin by focusing on the ways in which in which it was marked as a deficit from a national ideal. And I so I don't suggest that there's something unique about Konkani in this, but what is quite remarkable are the several criteria uh, from which it in fact deviates. So um, to give us to give you a brief sort of history of uh, when Konkani appears in writing, it did appear in some inscriptions prior to the 16th century, but it does not appear to have been the primary language of a literary text before that period. With the arrival of the Portuguese, it appeared as the dominant language of a literary text in the 16th century and became a print language in the 17th. So from, the majority, from a majoritarian perspective, it has the unforgivable history of having acquired distinction as a written and a literary language through the mediation of missionaries through Christianity and in the Roman script. A strategy employed by missionaries at the time was to master the cultural codes of a community, which they did everywhere, so that they could graft do doctrinal texts by reproducing genres, scripts, verse forms, and narrative patterns. The Christian texts, therefore, had cultural authority and constituted a high and late tradition, as they were either modeled on existing devotional forms or and indigenized Latin ones. Despite this high tradition to which upper caste Christians were affiliated from a nationalist perspective, this meant that the early history of Konkani was inextricably linked with Christianity. This changed in the 20th century. In the mid 20th century, manuscripts of excerpts from the Ramayana and Mahabharat, which are installed as the founding ep epics of the subcontinent, were found in a library in Portugal. These were from the 16th century and were in both Konkani and what is currently a dominant language on the Western coast, Marathi. This discovery of these manuscripts set off two different kinds of reaction. Uh, these are just some images of, of the manuscripts that were found. And, and uh, you know, the one on the extreme right is uh, a more modern uh, kind of rendering of, of the manuscripts. So the codices were in the Roman script and had probably been transliterated with the mediation of the Portuguese by a range of scribes from oral recitations. These codices became the gateway to a legitimate claim on cultural nationalism, as they promised to link Konkani to a pan-regional culture. They were the earliest signs of a literary culture 
preceding and enabling the production of Christian literature. This history, however, in as much as these texts were welcomed uh, because they gave Konkani a respectable uh, literary history, uh, it was, however, seen as a history that was constitutively corrupted by its Christian agents and by the Roman script. The value attributed to antiquity ensured these manuscripts a significant place within literary history, but as oral texts whose transition into writing was never complete. They were valuable as evidence of pre-16th century Konkani that remain to be restored to the contemporary through what I term translation. The discomfort with the Roman script was so comprehensive and the perceived cultural distance between the Roman and the Devanagari script was so great that I used the term translation as an umbrella term for transcriptions produced in the context of modern Konkani. The language used in the 16th century Mahabharata and Ramayan had to be salvaged from its script and restored to the moment when it was transliterated. The scene of transliteration is imagined as an interaction between missionary writing and indigenous recitations. Within this, recitation constitutes a moment as yet untouched by colonial influence. Though the 16th century has its own moments of accommodation, resistance, and appropriation, it is of little consequence to nationalist culture that associates it with Christianity. The moment when the language was committed to writing in the Roman script was also the point from this perspective when it was alienated from itself. This is not a unique story as most literary histories are not naturally structured in a manner that earns state recognition. Konkani, however, is an instance of a language that had to be purged of its script, its associ association with missionaries, its borrowings from Portuguese, in some instances, its borrowings from Persian and Arabic, and eventually of its appearance in colloquial popular print. Lastly, even when not in Roman, the multiplicity of scripts used for Konkani down the Western coast was a spatial disruption, a challenge to the conception of a singular linguistic community. Translations were the road taken to replace contemporary Konkani with an ideal conception of it that lay in the past. Different scholars identify different points from which they would ideally recover the language, and transcriptions from the Roman scripts to other scripts usually functioned as a corrective to the language. The translated text embodied a linguistic and literary exemplar for the future, but the text itself was not of central interest in the commentaries that preceded it. It was always about how the Konkani language could be correct corrected to furnish a language for the future. Across half a century, scholarly writing on Konkani virtually evacuated the language of its constitutive elements and of any value. It is even more startling then that within that period, it was simultaneously endowed with attributes of cultural dominance that eventually secured its state recognition. And in this, there's a stark difference with languages that are spoken by tribal communities that are still struggling for state recognition. In the late 19th century, Konkani was adopted by the Saraswat Brahmins of Goa as a sign of their cultural distinctiveness. This helped them carve out an identity that was defined against other Brahmin groups on the West Coast. The adoption of the language as a symbol of distinction meant that it acquired the backing of an upper caste literati, both Hindu and Catholic. The Devanagari script secured it a place within a 19th century conception of cultural nationalism, which associated the script with Sanskrit. There are other literary cultures in the subcontinent that use the Roman script. So writing in the Khasi language, various languages of Naga tribal groups, Santali and Mizo, for instance, continue to use the Roman script. In some instances, versions of the Roman script or orthography had become symbols for identity assertion. In the case of Santali, which is also a tribal language, both Roman and Devanagari were opposed by some sections to assert autonomy from Christian and from status discourses, and the old Chiki script has recently found acceptance. This need not be the case in the future, but for now, it appears that the Roman script is especially problematized only in cultures where a majoritarian cultural model is centered on caste and on a Sanskritic past. There is also evidently no necessary similarity across literary cultures that deviate from the national model. Instead, the challenge in recent decades has been to make cultural formations that are organized around particular geographies or symbols 
that do not necessarily converge with the nation or with statist ideas of culture visible. Geographies and cultural moments that are non-national do not necessarily represent subversive or progressive cultures. Yet these do mark a beginning towards disaggregating a cultural, a, a national model. I have so far been concerned with how the production of a single majoritarian model for language was seen as a symbol of decolonization and its consequences for a language that deviated in almost all its aspects from that model. While upper caste Hindu majoritarian, majoritarianism do dominated this discourse, it was evident that upper caste Christians also shared a desire for a high culture and recognition within the new order of cultural dominance that uh, the Indian post-independent state represented. While the Roman script was indigenous to the sphere of popular Goan Catholic religiosity, Portuguese linguistic policy had created a Lusophone elite that had relegated Konkani to the domain of the domestic, or at least did not have a public use for it, until they resurrected it as a sort of vanguardist uh, bourgeoisie, as a vernacular that had to be rescued at the end of the 19th century. Konkani in the Roman script was therefore doubly the focus of elite surveillance, when it also became the object of upper caste Catholic reform. The concern among the clergy and Catholic literati was that oral practices, grammatical errors, and loanwords from other languages had corrupted texts like the 17th century Dutrina Christa, produced by a Jesuit missionary. As it continued to circulate as popular devotional material among lay Christians, elite Catholics began to suggest that new editions should be translations back to different versions of 16th and 17th century Konkani. This archaic Konkani for them was the way forward for the community. I could only find one editor of, uh, of a progressive newspaper who asked whether it would actually be seen as a viable option if the Portuguese were told to return to the Portuguese of Camões or to you know, any kind of 16th century Portuguese as a viable way forward for the community. The other focus of reform, apart from devotional texts, was the colloquial and popular texts, the novels, newspapers, and ephemera that newly literate Catholics began to produce. Instead of examining these only as expressions of class identity, the challenge was to trace whether there was a relationship to language that was different from literary texts that were more responsive to nationalist philology. There was a surge in popular Konkani printed texts in the Roman script, as print became cheaper in the 19th century. These texts retained elements of an oral culture in which language was not a neutral vehicle of representation. Instead, the community encountered modernity by claiming language as their familiar, something they could wrap around themselves as they were introduced to a new migrant world. Bourdieu's conception of habitus as those unspoken dispositions collectively shared by all members of the group was a useful way to read popular texts written for a migrant community, finding their way in urban and alien settings. Habitus combined practice, judgments, categories, which together produced the represented social world, the lifestyle that characterized a group. Thus, habitus was different from law, as it could regulate society without an express call to order. It was not solely regulatory, as it made improvisation possible. The distribution of objects within a house, for instance, Bourdieu stated, is habitus at its freest, or one could say, least self-conscious. This conception encapsulates Konkani usages and texts that may have been didactic, critical, or instructive, as they coaxed readers towards emotive states that would accustom them to new economic and temporal structures. Tones of address drew from oral interactions, and literary content and style moved between what was familiar and what was new. These aspects extended the habitus of Konkani so that its speakers and readers could find their place in relation to the demands of modernity without surrendering or breaking from the limits of a moral society. This perspective offers analytical tools to identify literary and linguistic strategies in popular print, irrespective of the social origins of writers. It illuminates, for instance, an important distinction between the vocabularies and dictionaries produced by linguists and literary scholars, and those that were written specifically for Goan migrants who needed to expand their vocabularies rapidly as their employment took them into alien kitchens, steamships, factories, and homes. Vocabularies and dictionaries 
that signified travel had limited lists of words, often pertaining to particular professions and were meant to facilitate transition to employment outside the home. Such vocabularies <clears throat> would have been used by those who were literate, but who were probably closer to an oral culture. Walter Ong, the theorist of oral culture states, oral cultures of course have no dictionaries and few semantic discrepancies. Or he says, an oral culture has no vehicle as neutral as a list. These aphoristic statements draw attention to the fact that these vocabularies were publications whose relevance was contingent on their immediate use. They did not present themselves as representations of language as a whole, but as an aid to the subset of language that a user would need. I have recently actually watching, uh, you know, some of the, the talks on this forum, uh, found the, the concept of translanguaging uh, useful and uh, I've tentatively used it here, though I've not seen it used in relation to print. But it lends itself to this form of contact between languages whose users do not conceive of linguistic or cultural wholes separate from them. But they select those aspects of a linguistic culture that they need as newcomers to navigate it. Bourdieu also differentiated between the standpoint of someone listening to or studying a language and a speaker who used language as a means of action and expression. Language did not merely ex execute an overarching grammatical logic, but was a practice that extended and renewed the habitus, especially in times of change. Ong's formulations of oral cultures continue to be the most sensitive to such linguistic worlds. He notes the tendency to situational rather than categorical thinking in oral cultures that do not manifest a context-free or autonomous written discourse detached from the author. In contrast to this, cross-referenced vocabularies drew on historical usages and authoritative texts of the past and became canonic canonical representations of the Konkani language. However, the vocabulary in five languages in English, Portuguese, Konkani, Marathi, and Urdu produced in 1878 carried entries for numbers, collective nouns, trees, clothes, and I quote, things pertaining to the universe and land. While the Manual de Trejmil vocabulary of 1892 had lists of food, drinks, and table service, which those employed in kitchens might use. Each of these made a selective choice of domains that migrants would need to navigate a multilingual universe. Thus, as habitus, language was not separated as a distinct object from other dimensions of the social world, including the economic life of migrants. Each genre of popular print allowed for an unfolding of a dimension of life in a new social world by training readers with social, economic, and professional information offered as a form of translanguaging. A guide to secret signals and romantic signs suggested how romance could be conducted across the balconies of Bombay apartments. A letter, writing, a letter writing guide taught a migrant son to ask for tobacco to be sent from home and to apply for a job. Pedro Diaz's the, the Go and Cook's Guide of 1894 combined the vocabulary with the cookbook. Its select vocabulary in English, French, Hindustani, and Konkani, along with interest tables, salary charts, glossaries, and menus, would allow Go and Cooks to gain a grip on exactly those words, measures, and meanings they would need in the course of their daily work. Recipes in Konkani for the half pay pudding, conservative pudding, Nurse Hannah's pudding, and mysterious pudding translated culturally distinct objects and processes across languages. These least studied texts, the Swahili Gujarati language primers, or Konkani Swahili vocabularies, produced at the turn of the 19th century, not only chart the objects and occupations that constituted a transition from an oral culture, but they signal the zone of contact languages in which migrants across class and community had to acquire new language equivalences rapidly, whether as civil servants, shopkeepers, or construction workers. Rather than exclusively mapping popular linguistic production to class location, which is actually a difficult task, the concepts of translanguaging and habitus allow such literary strategies to acquire definition. For instance, Konkani speakers emphatically rejected the imperative to change their political stances and their grammar when the demand originated outside the habitus from the world of formal linguists and scholars. However, the same critiques of orthography and grammar were accepted when articulated as a shared community practice towards social advancement. 
There are other political strategies that come to light. Newspapers and books self-consciously refer to themselves and to other forms of print. Their advertisements address readers as their male kin, our brothers, our compatriots. They had the intense colloquial vigor of a public political language that simulated a relationship with the state and with the Portuguese speaking elite, knowing that they were scarcely heard. Speech patterns were reproduced. The community was addressed through possessive pronouns and colloquialisms, even as this writing simultaneously performed an outward public political discourse. Another aspect that characterizes migrant Konkani literature is its multilingual feature. Multilingualism as a recognition of our way of being has also transformed Sanskrit studies. Recent work argues that canonical texts that we imagined were written exclusively in Sanskrit, in fact contained Prakrit usages, indicating an always multilingual literary world. This perspective of linguistic worlds as always necessarily multilingual throws light on one 19th century translated text, the Kissa Sal Anbiya, a history of the saints from Adam, a rare sign of the presence of Islamic culture in the 19th century history of Konkani print. This text, which was printed in Bombay, was listed in a British library catalogue and described as a translation into Konkani. The catalogue entry added that it was written in Sindhi characters. Sindhi is yet another language spoken by a community and across, uh, across Pakistan and, uh, and present-day India. Uh, the then curator for South Asia confirmed to me, I don't read... Uh, I, I don't read the Arabic and the Urdu script. The then curator for South Asia confirmed that it was written in the Nask or Nastalik typeface, which is used for Arabic, Sindhi, Urdu, and other languages, and that the content relied heavily on Arabic and Persian terminology with possible Sindhi usages. Though this is the only instance I have of Konkani in this script from this time, aspects of this publication typify the nature of literary production in this sphere. Bio trilingual texts such as the Kissa Salanbia had a wide circulation and appeared in a range of genres. The curator elaborated that the introductory paragraph said, and I quote her, the author has translated the work into Konkani so that it will be useful to Konkani speaking Muslims seeking religious guidance. He specifically, she refers to uh, the, uh, the author in the preface, he specifically mentions female Muslims, Muslimat, as the target audience, in addition to Muslim men, Muslimin. While Muslimin ba Muslimat, is a Quranic phrase that often gets repeated in Islamic religious discourse, she said. Its use here seems to be deliberate, with a view to including female readers in the audience. If, as the curator suggested, the Kissa Salanbiya did in fact particularly mention women, had Konkani and Nastalik become part of the habitus of devotional reading or recitation in domestic contexts on the western coast of India? The fact that the book was printed in Bombay, along with its Sindhi usages, points to a zone of circulation extending across the Indian Ocean. Perhaps the unremarked on transition between Konkani, Sindhi, Arabic and Persian that the Kissa Sal Anbiya demonstrates is an aspect of literary possibility that minor cultures demonstrate. Bio-trilingual texts were response to the context of trade, ecumenism and labor that brought people into contact with each other. They help us sidestep the compulsion to tell singular literary histories and to divide the world of writing and speech into successive temporal intervals. Could one employ the term code switching to capture the literary strategies used in other texts, or was it another form of, of translanguaging? For instance, adaptations of the life of Julius Caesar or Napoleon Bonaparte were advertised as translations in, in uh, popular Konkani. These texts used the proper name of a historical figure, but populated it with local material. Perhaps this was only a tactic to increase sales. It was as though if these texts used the name of well-known figures to comment on contemporary Goa, or to assess the political value these historical figures represented against the situation of ordinary people, it provided some kind of legitimacy to, uh, to these perspectives on Goan history. In some cases, the ancient history of Goa was rewritten to include the rights and aspirations of an underclass, but under the name of Julius Caesar or the life of Napoleon Bonaparte, who's said to have visited uh, Goa. 
Unlike the translanguaging vocabulary or the guide to romance and letter writing, which approach the unknown without paying obeisance to a prior authority, the realm of the literary perhaps could not be entered without affixing the name of someone who properly owned that space. Stories about the demise of monarchies and aristocracies were popular as in other parts of the world. They created the space to enact and legitimize the rise of protagonists through individual effort that had little to do with circumstances of birth. The first Konkani novel was simply called Landlord or Batkar. The main protagonist was a landlord and the bulk of the novel detailed and satirized his life and his shortcomings. However, the interstices of the novel contain details about the recent past in Goa, about weddings, medical and agrarian practices, all of which were a concern for Goan migrants who had left home and would return once a year to Goa. Read alongside the life of Julius Caesar, it appears as though the place of the main protagonist still had to be inhabited, still had to be inhabited by a socially prominent figure, but the interstices of the story could be inhabited by everybody else. Popular histories of Goa likewise repeated the idea of an idealized ancient past and reproduced some traces of Brahminical geographies of origin, but inserted subordinate groups at the point of origin as a way to lay claim to land. While such approaches help us depart from the constraints of philologically determined literary histories, this does not suggest that the world of transitional orality and multilinguality was necessarily freer or progressive. Popular Konkani newspapers represented select neighborhoods in the city of Bombay, populated by Goan Catholic migrants, spatially and socially. They both enabled and contained the encounter with the unfamiliar by restricting the horizon of moral and cosmological reference to a rural Catholic worldview that was punitive of migrant women. For a period of time, it allowed for the participation of readers across castes in an abstract cultural unity until its limits began to be tested. Newsprint was like a homecoming, as it re repeopled the world of the migrant by populating it only with the familiar. Yet it also openly broke with these barriers by interrogating caste, nationalism, the moral rectitude of working women, and forms of elitism. I return now to the critique of Konkani from the perspective of transcription and translation studies. The 19th century, when the Catholic elite spoke of Konkani as though it was in decline, was in fact the moment it acquired a diverse life in popular, in popular print, which they weren't, of, co of course, reading. A book of Portuguese and Konkani songs, titled The Ramalhetinho, was published in the mid-19th century by a prominent member of the Goan Catholic elite. It spoke of Konkani songs, but not the Portuguese ones, as though they were likely to disappear, just as there was a simultaneous surge in Konkani print. In Portuguese literary writing, Konkani appeared as an eruption of the colloquial within formal speech or as a parallel language of political commentary. At the end of the century, in a Portuguese novelistic satire, Konkani was the earthy primary language in, into which the insufficiently educated elite slipped with their inadequate grasp of Portuguese. It represented the world of body witticisms that reveal the underbelly of polite society. This novel, the novelistic satire, appeared in 1896, at the same time as Konkani was being valorized by upper castes as a primal poetic reserve of folk culture. The language was therefore configured differently in each linguistic context. The difference between these views on Konkani and the prior concept of habitus is striking if we consider two aspects on naming the language. A literary historian who was in favor of Marathi as the official language of Goa wrote an entire book on the print history of Goa without using the term Konkani. Instead, he used the phrase Brahmin dialect, which was first employed by a Jesuit in the 17th century who had composed a text in Konkani. For the supporter of Marathi, Konkani was no more than a dialect, a language that should never have been named. In contrast, its speakers also often did not name it, but used the term Amchi Bhash, which literally is our speech our lang or our language often the only term used to denote the language. The history of Konkani, or the nature of its encounter with statist modernity, lies in the transition between not needing to be named by its speakers to a refusal to name it by its opponents. Perhaps we can see this relationship where language is not named, 
as a sign that the habitus persisted for the community, enclosing it, limiting it, but also creating avenues through which new experiences could be reached. My experience of writing a book about this question revealed that it is almost impossible to tell a linear history of the language or its literature as it deviates from so many of the unspoken expectations of literary history. The Roman script was one of the five scripts in which it was written across the Western coast. It did not have a unified territory and was spoken in small regions along what's called the Kunkan coast. It became a political symbol for one particular caste who used it to consolidate their dominance, even while the much criticized popular literature developed in the same language. Colonization by the Portuguese meant that aside from extensive use by missionaries, the language of administration, of elite expression, and of intellectual discourse was Portuguese, as is the case in most of its other colonial territories. Unlike mainland India, therefore, a bilingual intellectual sphere with all its expected social and material developments could not be found in Goa. If, in the first three-fourths of the 20th century, Konkani was a language without a state, Devnagri, as its script, had scarcely any readership. A quote from a prominent writer suggests that in 1945, there were only 10 to 15 books in the approved script Devnagri and a thousand books in the Roman script. When the language received official recognition in 1987 and then in 1992, only the Devnagri script was recognized. The appearance of a translated or transcribed Ramayana or Mahabharat in Devnagri in the mid-20th century was therefore received as the point of arrival for a language, a text, and for its readers. And I end here. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Prof. Penzo, for this wonderful presentation. Um, I now hand over to uh, Prof. Makoni. Oh, thank you very much, Professor Pinto. Um, thank you. Yes, yes. I, I have a couple of um, minor questions, uh, which, I'm, which I was trying to address for myself as you went along. Um, the, the going context, from your experience in um, in India, uh, was it was it unique in terms of the interplay between scripts, missionary, um, the different languages? Was this a very unique situation, or do you see it uh, played out in other contexts in India? Um. It is, it is unique to the degree that the Roman script, uh, in fact, enjoyed the kind of legitimacy that it did. And that, in mm -hmm. fact, uh, you know, the Bible was commonly read in it. Um, and um, I think the, the issue is really that in other regions where the Roman script is used, you do not have a, a sort of uh, a cultural center that's, uh, that's defined through a sort of Sanskritic majoritarianism. So the mm -hmm. Roman script is not problematized in the same way in other territories where, where it is used. Um, and the other uh, issue also is that wherever the Portuguese had uh, enclaves along the Western coast, they didn't have the kind of impact on the state that they had in Goa. So it is unique. Uh, it is relatively unique in the Indian context. Oh, okay. And then you, you also talked about the, the tendency to view the writing in Sanskrit as if it was monolingual, but you suggested that you, it's possible to interpret. Um, I, I didn't uh, get you very clearly there. I, were you saying that it's possible to, uh, to give, to do a multilingual analysis of Sanskrit? Is that what you were saying? Yeah, so it's not uh, it's not I who say it, but Sanskrit scholars have taken on the challenge of multilingualism. And then when they examine Sanskritic texts that we've always read, I mean, not that I read it, but that have always been studied as exclusively Sanskrit texts, they find that there are obviously usages uh, in other languages that were spoken at the time. So it's like uh, it is like disaggregating even the Sanskritic model to say that we need to even think about this point of civilizational origin as always multi multilingual. And always challenged. So, oh, okay. So the the argument then there is that the the initial instantiation of Sanskrit or other languages was multilingual. 
right um yes i think what they're challenging is actually um a kind of normative literary model of Sanskrit so it's because San Sanskrit enjoyed that dominance and it produced mm. an immense corpus of text it also in a sense represents itself so this idea of being at the beginning of being uh, an original refined language is in fact yeah. a Sanskritic uh, conception of Sanskrit literature and it's that that's being challenged now through multilingualism oh okay okay then the other aspect that you talked about is you suggested that you don't see a linear development right. of the histories of uh, some of these languages. Can you yeah. elaborate a little bit more on this? Yeah, I think what I'm trying to say is that uh, linear, the idea of literary history as, uh, as, as marking a linear and continuous appearance of written texts is in fact a, a sort of legacy of colonial philology. And there are many, many languages that cannot demonstrate that continuity. And even the languages that do, uh, that do demonstrate it, it is in a sense a kind of fabrication. Um, oh, so what? Okay. One, yeah, uh, that's what I was I was trying to argue. Oh, okay. So you're saying that to some extent, the issue about the linearity or the historiography of linearity is just part of the the fiction of that methodology that they were using. Yes, yeah. And in the case yeah. of India, there's great, there's extraordinary value always to producing a classical text. Oh, okay. okay. Yeah. So, so each language, to some extent, then is in search of a classical text. Absolutely. Um, some, some origin Ab that, that, you need, that you need in order to be able to make the yeah. yeah. art. It's lecture. almost, it's explicitly a rite of passage in the 60s. Uh, in fact, mm -hmm. you'd have literary scholars saying, produce a translation, uh, you know, of the Mahabharata in your language, and then you get literary recognition from the sort of state literary organization, and then the state gives you official recognition as a language. So it's, oh, okay. it, you know, it's via literature that you get uh, state of uh, state recognition. Okay. So that's it's begun to be challenged, but yeah, it... Uh, yeah. I see what you mean. It's more or less like in other parts of the world. It's, it's like you need to produce grammars and dictionaries. Exactly, yeah. Order. Yes, okay. Yeah. So if that is the case then, um, in addition to, let's say, talking about code switching or translanguaging, your work seems to fall under the broad umbrella of language ideologies. Because what you are talking about makes sense to me in terms of the different language ideologies, let's say of the missionaries, the, um, the everyday individuals in, uh, in Goa, et cetera. We, we, that is if I'm defining language ideology simply as attitudes about language or towards language, which are held by uh, different individuals. Because it appears that let's say the Brahmis, the missionaries, they may have had very different language ideologies towards language. So do you really, do you think the notion of language ideologies would be helpful in explicating the context that you are dealing with? I think it would be too general a context. So for instance, I think things that are particular to a Sanskritic literary self-conception is something that Brahmins began to take on. And I think there is a very strong convergence between colonial Indology and yes. the self-representation of Brahmins, which is why it retains that it, you know, it, it has such an influence even in post-independent states is because it actually validates the cultural symbolism of, of Brahmins. So oh. it's, yeah, it's not merely an individual ideology. It is, in fact, mm. the state, you know, the state. Ideology. it's a normative state ideology. Yeah, it usually will represent uh, cultural nationalism. Mm -hmm. Cultural nationalism is, you know, as, as critiques have pointed out, it is Brahminical. Uh, it is, in fact, Brahminical culture. Uh, that's yeah. been now, you know, it's being dismantled, but it, it, it continues as a very powerful force. Okay. So. Now, let me ask the, the last question, which is much yeah. more uh, pedantic. Um, Let's say within the Brahmins themselves, were there any controversies and debates about this issue? Absolutely. In fact, the only reason why Konkani acquired state recognition was because it's one small group of Brahmins on, in Goa 
who uh -huh. were uh, for centuries seem to have been in a rivalry. And I think actually in, in sort of land struggles, all kinds of disputes over purity with other Brahmin groups that may have been more powerful or had more prestige. So because they adopted Konkani as their cultural symbol, they actually endowed it with patronage. They gave it this Devanagari script. And the only the reason why it acquired state recognition is because because it had the backing of Brahmins. Uh -oh. uh, and it continues now to be backed by private capital that's predominantly uh, Brahminical. Uh, aside from, you know, other, aside, it's not like there isn't popular support, but that's uh -huh. like a different story. The reason why it achieved state recognition, uh, you know, as soon as it did, in, if you compare the struggles of other languages, is, yeah. is because it had the backing of this group. But they couldn't, they had to completely, so it's, uh, you know, this whole evacuation of the language that I'm talking about, it had to be done for it to be converted into a suitable language. Oh, God. Oh, God. It yeah. had to be purged of its missionary association, its Christian association, the Roman script, etc. So mm -hmm. it had to be transformed into the normative model for it to gain state recognition. Okay. Then the, the last uh, question is just... Um, an observation, but let me begin by giving you an anecdote. Yes. Um, once in a while, I read um, 19th century African dictionaries. But what I find fascinating when I read them is not so much what the dictionaries write and say and entries, but what is written in the prefaces, the yes. narratives yes. and the stories that they tell in the prefaces are to me much more illuminating. In these complex texts that you have, uh, you, you have got, do you read the, the, the prefaces and the forewords? Because they tell you a very interesting, uh, give you a very interesting insight into how these dictionaries are produced or were produced. Uh, yes, in fact, actually, the book that I wrote was based predominantly on prefaces because once I began oh. reading them, I realized they were not, they were barely concerned with the content of the text they were yes. translating. They were actually concerned with purging, with producing a suitable language. And yes. that's when I realized that there was something up that, you know, each text was grappling. So the, the elite Christians wanted to remove colloquialisms or spelling mistakes. Uh, the Hindu elite wanted to remove the script altogether. So in some way or the other, they had to just keep evacuating the language. And so then the text that they translated was the sort of exemplar for the future. But the, the interest was not very much with the content of the text. It was about sort of furnishing the language. It, it was like producing a language through translation. Okay, okay, yeah, thanks a lot. Thank you, thank you. Yeah. Let me give over to Chanel and Philip. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, thank you, everyone. There are no questions or comments at the moment, so feel free to use the raised hand function or even just post your comments and questions um, in the chat box. Um, so, Prof. McCauley and Prof. Kunz, if you would like to continue, feel free. Uh, maybe that will spark some okay. other questions to follow. Let me ask Lynn Mario what his take is on this. <laughs> well, I think he knows this context more than I will ever do. Uh, no, no, not as much as Rochelle. Yeah, um, okay, that's all right. <laughs> <laughs> but, that's uh, why I get uh, away with murder. The... <laughs> uh, Rochelle, I think uh, for what uh, we're interested in, particularly in this forum, and you 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 mentioned this very much, and I think this is basically a subtext in in what you're saying. You now, when you when you you talk about how uh, the Brahminical and especially the the the, the Hindu Brahmins uh, end up uh, with a certain kind of ownership of uh, official yes. the language of the the state. I think this is you know what what we call language ideologies are not necessarily the ideology of the state, but how different groups conceptualize languages and how these uh, conceptualizations may be conflicting with each other, right? They're multiple and conflicting. So what what uh, what interests us from the linguistic side is this uh, the the confrontation between monolingualism and multilingualism, you know, which mm -hmm. you mentioned uh, mm -hmm. various moments. And what happens again, as you 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 very clearly demonstrated, you know this uh, the reality of multilingualism, which is always there, 
you know, from my perspective at the beginning, is tends to be hidden when uh, when uh, literacy and writing come up, right? So writing, or let's say, I hesitate to use trans, uh, let's call it uh, uh, literation. When languages be become writing, you know, they have, they acquire this form of uh, concreteness, of stability, of permanence, which which tends to um, uh, militate against the multiness of language, the you know, the, and the fact that language is constantly changing and changes over space and time. So, uh, you know, and uh, one of the things you 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 mention a lot, uh, uh, Boudier's concept of habitus. Yeah? Um, uh, and uh, you know, I, I'm a, a reader of of, of uh, Boudier, but I'm also a reader of Jacques Rancière. You know, who was a who was a critic of Boudier, because uh, they're both basically saying very similar things, but from different perspectives, right? So whereas uh, Boudier is trying to give value to groups which have been excluded and marginalized by saying, this is how they behave, this is how they think, and this is how they speak, etc. What uh, Ranciere is saying is that you're by doing that, you're using a top-down perspective of nomatization, right? So habitus, in fact, is another name for norm, right? This was uh, Ranciere's critique by saying certain groups uh, follow certain norms, and norms tend to be top down. Now, the important the importance of looking at uh, marginalized groups, or and this is a case of I think Konkani teaches teaches us a lot about this. Um, the importance of looking at marginalized groups is exactly the wealth of phenomena, cultural and linguistic, uh, when they're looked at from a bottom up perspective and not from a top down perspective, right? And so. Uh, when we see, for example, uh, when naming a language comes into practice, then suddenly it becomes from a top-down perspective, right? Beginning from a concept of a stable written norm and uh, imposing that idea on a language. Now, when we look at it from a bottom-up perspective, and you mentioned this you know, in 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 practically all of your work, you know the 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 writings in Konkani of the non the non-elite, uh, the non-Brahmanical elites. So when we look at it from the non-hegemonic uh, perspective, we still see a multi-wealth in that language, right? So what I'm saying is that, you know, uh, I, in my work, I, I, I tend to re make an attempt to recuperate the multi hidden in the mono, right? And what we can see, looking at it in Goa at the moment, not in its history. So uh, when you look at the language people call Konkani in Goa, right? depending on who you're talking to and where you're speaking, it can be a very different reality, right? So that's what I'm I'm talking about. Now, if, if you look at the word Konkani, which names the language, then the image that you get is that we're speaking of a singular language, and then we tend to fall into the, the habitus way of thinking and the, the written norm way of thinking and the grammars, etc. But when we look at it from a top-down perspective, those who speak Konkani are actually speaking uh, a very multifaceted um, linguistic phenomenon. Uh, could you comment on that? Yeah, thanks, Lynn, for uh, for elaborating for elaborating that. So, um, when I'm looking at this uh, this realm of print, one thing that I need to say is that it is actually difficult to trace. Uh, I'm trying to get away from what I did earlier, which is to pin this to um, the perspective of an underclass, right? It's very obvious that they're speaking against a kind of elitism. They explicitly, they very innovatively actually name and describe the kind of elitism that they are opposing. And it is a sort of lusophone sort of, you know, aristocracy, including their local landlord in the village. So apart from the city, right, all of these. But it is, uh, but the other thing, of course, is that it's very likely that these could be Munkar Brahmins, right? It's uh, so they could still be upper caste, but not uh, not upper class. And so actually, I thought to, you know, to do justice to the literary strategies and the linguistic strategies, which are very innovative, 
and which you don't find uh, outside of this group. That's the reason why I thought maybe I could use translanguaging because in some instances they are reaching across to a language, you know, in another continent. They're learning English and French, etc. But they're carving out what they need. So there isn't that sort of ethic perspective of, you know, needing to master a language as a whole, right? They also very explicitly reject any criticism that, you know, they spell badly or that their grammar is, um, is, is, is not uniform, unless it emerged from the editor of a newspaper who constantly talked about caste oppression. So when it was voiced as, look, you know, please, my brothers, those of you who are writing letters to the editor, can you write on one side of the page? Can you, you know, write legibly? Let's all have one spelling for this word. Otherwise, it's impossible to print a book. Then that was accepted. But any critique by the elite was was rejected. Okay. So the reason why I stick to that is because while I recognize, I mean, while I found habitus useful, though, I agree, you know, perhaps I'm also not employing it the way Bourdieu does, but actually I found when he talks about it in the abstract, it offers itself, uh, you know, uh, for use in, in this context, because I'm actually trying to get away from maybe the empirical group to talking about a literary or a linguistic strategy, right? And the, the other thing, of course, is that in as much as I may celebrate the innovativeness of this print sphere and, and the ways in which they made themselves, uh, they made their way in the world, it was contained by a kind of rural moral Catholic worldview. You know, it was punitive of uh, women migrants who were accused of prostitution because they also had to make their way alone in the city, right? And if I if I even look at the political sort of limits to the expression, the, it did seem to be contained in a certain way. So it's not as though they are without a norm or that I can, you know, uh, celebrate this in some sort of, uh, you know, an unqualified way. Uh, it, it was it was also contained while it, it kind of offers strategies that I think have not fully been explored. So, you know, there's a different, uh, it's almost like there's a different, there's a different strategy employed to produce a vocabulary. But when they're producing a novel, it's like the central space of the, the migrant cannot be the hero as yet. The migrant has to be the landlord. And the life of, you know, the life of the migrant is concealed somewhere in the novel. So those were things that I thought, you know, I'm, I'm trying to look for theoretical uh, in a sense, a sort of theoretical apparatus that will do justice to the difference of these, uh, the different strategies. Thank you, Rosha. Yeah. Actually, yeah. what I'd say is that the a, a critique of a norm is not in favor of a non-norm. A critique of a right. norm is, is is basically saying there are there's a multiplicity of norms, but right, yeah, but they're okay. all local and situated, right? Whereas yeah. a norm claims not to be local and not to be situated. Right. No, I'd, I'd agree with that. So if I had to specify, this is a Bardesi, uh, this is a North Goan Bardesi migrant sphere, right? And as you point out, if one were to actually get into the way the dialects represent each other, so it's one particular dialect that's been standardized. It's not as though there's a, you know, there's an attempt to draw in Konkani from different speakers, etc. So yeah, those divisions continue, as you, as you say, yeah. Uh, thank you. Uh, Mari Haneda, you have your hand up. Uh, Mari, you are muted. Sorry. Thank you for your presentation. Um, I wondered whether translingual practices would be a better theoretical framework than translanguaging. It comes from composition studies, and they have been looking at the kind of situation that you describe, uh, Bruce Homer uh, or Suresh Kanagaraja, his work is based in uh, Indian language practices. And he takes um, the sort of bottom up view that Lim Mario described. So it, it's sort of like describes similar phenomena, but they focus on written text much more. So there are uh, books published on um, translingual uh, writing practices in the in literacy studies and not literally studies as well as composition studies. So just a thought. Thank you. I'll you know I'll take Lin's and you know pursue uh, Lin for his insights. So uh, yeah, to help me with this. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Mari. Um, yeah, so if you want to join the conversation, feel free to just post in the 
in the chat or um, raise your hand. Arthur, I see that you're writing notes. Do you want to jump in? Yeah, um, <laughs> there's something I'm trying to clarify in my mind. And by the way, thank you very much for that presentation. Uh, I'm a Creolist, but I don't focus on uh, Portuguese Creoles and so on and so forth. Not implying that it's a Creole language, but um, here's what I'm trying to uh, clarify in my mind, and perhaps you can help me with this. What I'm thinking about is the notion of autonomy, and I'm not clear from what you said, and, and some of your talk I couldn't hear because of audio problems on my side. Uh, how did Konkani establish its autonomy from Marathi such that we ended up with the situation of Konkani being the uh, uh, recognized official language in Goa, but not Marathi, and Marathi being the official language in surrounding uh, legal jurisdictions. So with the issue of autonomy, how did Konkani, that's what I see as one of the major threads in this historical narrative. How did Konkani establish its autonomy from similar and closely related language such that it could gain the status that it has today? And of course, you attached it to a significant extent to those who speak it. In other words, elites in, in various areas in that region. Uh, so could you speak to the question of autonomization historically such that we arrived at the present day situation? Uh, yes, thanks. Thank you. So there's a twofold path. One is that the Portuguese, you know, I think drawing from uh, from British colonialism believed that they had to find something called the vernacular. And it's actually a Portuguese official who began to talk about the need to save this language, which of course wasn't dying, but wasn't being spoken by the or used publicly by the elite. It may have been spoken by them. And so you have a kind of Catholic elite adopting this, you know, beginning to talk about the need to save Konkani. But at the same time, you do have uh, the Hindu Brahmin elite who actively adopt it as a symbol of distinction. And they begin to hold literary meetings. Uh, they begin to produce grammars. Uh, they begin to, uh, you know, search for literature. And they then begin, they, give, they endow it with a script, which in the 19th century was, began to be associated with Sanskrit. So they essentially, um, you know, bestow uh, all these attributes of, uh, of cultural respectability on the language, which is what allowed it to succeed. As a matter of fact, Marathi does enjoy official status in Goa. It's it's like, uh, you know, there are various ways in which um, states in India can, can bestow officials. So you can say this is the official state language, but it will be written in the script. Or Marathi is also the official language, right? And then the also naming it second is an indicator that uh, uh, that it's so actually, you know, it's good to look at language at, across the 19th and 20th century in India as a sort of overburdened sign of political identity, because every 20 years, the relationships change and you have to look for who's supporting this language and in which script, because it literally can turn on its head. Um, so uh, strangely enough, in you know, soon after uh, liberation from the Portuguese, the government that took over wanted to oust the Saraswat Brahmin. So they actually pushed for Marathi. Mm -hmm. And they wanted Marathi because Konkani had been adopted as a sign. So it sometimes has nothing to do with what people are speaking or what they're writing in. You know, it's uh, literally a fight over, over cultural symbols. And like I said, every 20 years, so Marathi in the contemporary is the language of, in fact, lower caste assertion because Konkani is so overwhelmingly now seen as a Brahminical or the official Konkani. The official Konkani is seen as, uh, you know, associated with the state and with the Brahmins who supported it. So um, Marathi is the language now of uh, of lower caste political assertion. So mm -hmm. it's... Uh, well, let me ask another question. To, yeah. to uh, What is the Portuguese element in Cockney? 
it's classified, um, you know, uh, various places as an Indo-Aryan language, as are closely related and surrounding languages in the area. So what is the, can you describe the Portuguese element in Cockney? Yeah, the Catholic, uh, the, the Cockney that the Catholics speak is heavily, um, well, heavily influenced by Portuguese, but not the con not necessarily, and also in, in certain areas. Um, and uh, yeah, but it's, um, let's just say it's not, uh, that's not a very visible and not an articulated borrowing. Just as race is not an articulated category of social analysis in, in, in India or in Goa where uh, one sees the need for it. So also sort of Portuguese borrowings, it's not something that people are conscious of. But linguists, uh, you know, know that uh, generally the, the company that the Catholics speak is heavily influenced by Portuguese. Mm -hmm. uh, one last question. Uh, this is fascinating material. Uh, do the speakers themselves see Cockney as, uh, how should I put it, a form of Portuguese or rather a form, uh, a language form closely related uh, to the surrounding um, Indian languages, in other words, Indo-Aryan languages? How, how do the speakers, those who carry it, so to speak, and support it, see it? in uh, terms of uh, it's um, it yeah family it, uh, depends. Relationships. Well, it depends on who you're talking to so nobody would relate it to portuguese at all um you know people closer to the border with maharashtra know that the language is very similar but you can take a konkani speaker you know from northern goa and they literally say they do not understand marathi even though grammatically if you're looking at the languages there are extra, there are lots of similarities but it's sometimes about perceived difference. It's sometimes about limited exposure. Um, so it's it's a difficult question to answer. It depends on on where you are, whom you're speaking to, what the political answer is at the time. Mm -hmm. um, so grammatically, there's no question that there, are in, that there are interrelations. But all through the 20th century, because those who wrote grammars were also concerned with defining its autonomy, they would point out that, in fact, there are lots of Dravidian usages as well. So it is really, it is like a contact languages. It, it does have uh, formations that are shared by South Indian languages, but the, its dominant grammatical structure draws from, you know, the Indo-European Indo family. But nobody who, uh, you know, an everyday speaker of Konkani is neither interested nor may be aware of, uh, of these, uh, these facts. Uh-huh. Okay. Thanks a lot. Thanks so much, Akta, and thanks, Prof. Um, Ampunsa, as well. Um, there is um, a question from Sangeeta. Um, I'm wondering about your turn to a non-local concept like translanguaging and putting that against code switching, which is another non-local normed way of discussing human communication. What other ways of theorizing and conceptualizing the richness of human communication could you use um, in your material? Yeah, I actually was was not looking at communication. I was looking at these strategies in the in the popular print culture, and I found that there were quite distinctive stra strategies <clears throat> depending on the kind of genre that people were producing. So vocabularies seemed to have one strategy, but when they were looking when they were producing genres that seemed to have the mark of the literary or the stamp of the literary, it's as though they had a, they were producing a kind of stowaway literature. So it's like their interests and things that were of concern to them or their memories or the objects that fascinated them were placed in the text, but not at the center of the text. And it was that, so those seemed to me like two different kinds of strategies. And up to now, I've sort of been trying to focus on the identities of, of the writers. And that's something that's very difficult to unearth because they weren't, uh, they weren't very prominent people. But I also actually sometimes listening to the talks on the forum, I, I, I thought actually that linguistic, uh, some linguistic concepts might speak more directly or do more justice to these and what I see as, as an innovative use of print um, and a way of sort of entering into, into the sphere of writing and migration and travel, <clears throat> etc., cetera, uh, by adopting these different, uh, these different strategies. So I agree, yes, I've, I've sort of taken them on from another realm. And uh, I think Lynn has pointed out some problems and uh, 
uh, Professor Maconi as well with, uh, you know, the uh, the way in which, say, I, I use habitus. But yeah, I've been, because it's actually a range of, of strategies that this group comes up with, uh, I'm kind of looking for um, for maybe theoretical, uh, appropriate theoretical constructs too. Um, uh, Musna, I see you nodding your head. What, how does this sound? How does this come across? Is Musna still around? Yes, yes, I, I'm <laughs> yes, around. Yeah, yeah I, I wasn't nodding my head, but like I have, I have been thinking about it, but in, um, First of all, thank you for a fascinating talk. It's uh, it's the whole context is new to me, mm -hmm. but I'm currently engaged with a reversed uh, linguistic phenomena, which is not uh, how a language gains recognition, but actually how a language gets demoted. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I have been no language. Arabic, and I'll I'll just uh, and this is why I was like kind of thinking about the other way around, not how a language gets recognized by nation states, but how actually what happens when a language lose, gets demoted in the sense that it loses its official status, <laughs> which, happened, yeah, which happened to Arabic a few years ago uh, when uh, Israel passed the nation state law mm -hmm. and uh, defined Israel as the Jewish nation state for the Jewish people only and uh, also demoted Arabic. So, um, so as like you know, while while we as linguists are interested uh, all the time with with uh, what happens when a language gets rec more recognition, uh, I have been struggling with <laughs> with the question or with addressing the question of what happens when a language loses its recognition, which is something that is uh, that rarely happens. Uh, so uh, if we go back to history, it only happened like maybe uh, uh, very, very few times. And I would like uh, if people here have any more uh, kind of knowledge about other cases, I, I would really appreciate sharing these uh, cases with me because I found, for example, that it happened in uh, uh, Quebec in 1977 where English was demoted. And... Um, uh, so, so I was like trying to understand also um, that it's the written form that, you know, uh, so, so the, the struggle was over this, the, the written form of, um, of a Konkani, right? I, I hope that I'm pronouncing this right. So uh, uh, in the case of Arabic, it's uh, Arabic has a well-established written form but it's losing its uh, a legitimacy as a formal written language here uh, within Palestinians in Israel. So I wonder what what do you think, uh, like from your experience with the archival data, what do you think might be an, uh, like uh, a significant process that uh, might give insights for looking at you know a, a reversed phenomena, but through analyzing more or less similar processes. Because I think that we're talking about here uh, uh, similar things. It's all about asymmetrical relations of power. It's about uh, uh, you know uh, who 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 uh, has more power to decide what. Is recognized as a, like the, the the questions and the kind of the observations seem to be similar, but the outcomes are totally the opposite. So um, this is why I was kind of uh, trying um, to get into this deep thinking while you were talking about the process itself. I would be really interested in, in learning more about the process. Thank you. Thank you. That's uh, that's that's really interesting. It uh, it sort of struck me as I kind of keep doing research, you know, dipping into the nineteenth and then the mid twentieth century. That often we're talking about uh, cultural symbols and transacting in in cultural symbols. So there seem to be, um, you know, say in the modern world, there seem to be certain centers where where languages are consecrated. Uh, sometimes it's the state, but sometimes it's certain kinds of literary formations. And for as long as a language can demonstrate uh, affiliation or support from some of these centers, sometimes it could be religious or a sort of religious literary formation, or if it's consecrated as folk, then it's allowed to survive even when it loses uh, 
even when it loses state recognition. Uh, so it's um, so. For instance, if I if I were to think of languages that still cannot gain state recognition in India, it's largely because they remain oral. They remain oral. They cannot demonstrate the production of culture. Uh, what in India are culturally significant texts, right? Uh, they aren't necessarily so. What happens typically in India is because of this uh, overburdening of cultural symbolism, questions of, you know, what is the language of the economy? What is the language of education? Which language will give you access to new economies? Everything is sort of uh, overlaps. So there's no space to think out these questions separately because they all converge then eventually into questions of identity. So the people who argue for recognition by the state of one language will send their kids to a school that's a, that's sort of teaching another language because obviously the the economic interests and the cultural interests are, are divergent and then they're kind of called hypocrites in the press and things but it's actually about just overburdening language with that uh, you know with with these questions i actually what i find interesting also is the way portuguese lost power almost overnight so as a language in goa which i mean i had no sympathies with earlier but when you think about colonial linguistic policy, if you're going to concentrate all intellectual production in one language, right, and then you remove that language overnight, and the elite, the elite, of course, by the 19th century had begun to learn English and were, you know, producing English. But literally, it makes you wonder, what do you do to a society if you've more or less made sure that there's very little literary production in one language, all power rests with the other, and then with the handover to India, um, the you, you know Portuguese just disappears overnight and is suppressed actually for quite a few decades until until recently. Uh, so that's the other. I mean, when you talked about language losing the state, of course, it's a colonial language. There's no question about it. But there are consequences also for the society that's uh, that's left behind. Uh, mm -hmm. Well, um... thank you. Sorry. Yeah. Uh... Sorry, Arthur. Um, I see Cecile's hand is up, and then I will go to you next. Um, Cecile. Thank you, uh, Chanel, and sorry, Arthur, to speak before you. Anyway, uh, I, I just have a factual question. How was the um, what was the rate of literacy in the nineteenth century? Just, just, and and then I'll ask my question. <laughs> do you do you have any um, any sense? I mean, in this particular region. Yeah, I've forgotten for the moment, but it's extremely low. So it wouldn't yeah. have touched, yeah, five percent or yeah, a very very low literacy. Okay, and then okay. it, yeah, yeah. Actually, so yeah. the if I can just add, the interesting part is literally the Portuguese are not investing money in this region anymore. So actually, private schools begin to be set up in Marathi and English because the British state uh, is actually pouring in money uh, to get because they're getting an educated uh, sort of serving class from this region. And you have Marathi as a kind of political campaign. So by the time the Portuguese leave, there are far more Marathi and English schools than Portuguese schools uh, in, in this region, uh, which I thought was sort of interesting. And and sorry, I, I forgot to uh, to say that I really, really enjoy your talk. So thank you very much for, for sharing the material. Um, yeah, so I, I was uh, I, I was asking you about the literacy rate because I was wondering actually for whom these people were writing and and designing uh, designing these guides. You were talking about you know, don't know if you call it guy what what uh, genre uh, when when we, you talked about the written for uh, migrants, um, you know. So uh, I was wondering to what extent they were just, uh, you know, there was this, um, maybe this uh, targeted audience in mind, but actually that was not really uh, catered for them because they may not have been able to read it. So how would you, uh, how would you analyze that? And uh, the, the second question I have is about intertextuality. So you talked about different, genres, uh, registers, and d could you trace actually this intertextual, you know, instances where you would get a sense of how these writings are interpreted, you know, that, that would give you a good sense of, you know, the taken up by, you know, other writers, um, you know, um, about this material. So thank you. Thank you. Yeah. No, they definitely were being read. So the, it was 
so while it's a small print sphere, even compared to other Indian languages, so the stuff being produced in Bengali and Marathi outstrips the print runs, you know, by thousands and thousands, right? Mm -hmm. But it was a very vociferous and alive print sphere. Um, because, you know, um, Goans were, in a sense, always lettered, even marginally, right, either in the parish schools, particularly the Catholics, and then English education, and it may have been marginal, but it, it allowed them to get jobs in uh, British, uh, British colonies all across from Aden to Karachi, etc. Et so if you're looking at subscriptions, and even where people are writing and publishing from, some of these texts are being printed in Karachi, some in Bombay. Uh, some in, and uh, the religious publications are traveling to Aden and, you know, coming back, etc. So there definitely is a very, very active, and if one is reading the newspapers, they are sort of very, very vociferously voicing political ideas, discussing nationalism, um, etc. Uh, your second question, sorry, I've forgotten briefly if you could... It was uh, about intertextuality. and if That's you... right, yeah. 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 <laughs> so, so the interesting thing is, yeah, that's the other thing is, is sometimes there would be elite concerns or even the cultural symbols that the elite would sort of circulate. You'd find them repeated in these texts, but they were inhabited or populated by non-elite subjects. So typically, it's like the origin of Goa, uh, you know, uh, th there are Brahminical myths about how they settled the land of Goa, and, you know, they were there at the beginning. So you'll find a repetition of a secularized version of this, but it's the lower caste who were there at the beginning, you know. And similarly, there are many, there are many kinds of motives, or there would be, say, popular novels, including English novels. So you have G.W. Reynolds is you have versions of, uh, you know, mysteries of London that are produced in different Indian languages, and so also in Konkani, or detective stories. But interestingly, even, even detective fiction, it would be set in Bombay, and it became a structure through which migrants could talk about their lives, you know, or they would talk about the multiplicity of Indian communities they found there, etc. So this sort of covert uh, taking over of a genre is something that I found quite fascinating, and I've been trying to find literary terms and I'm actually not trained as a linguist so it's sort of I've just begun to try and read uh, you know linguistic theories because they seem to speak to these uh, strategies better than some literary analysis uh, uh, you know because it, what's innovative about them is the way that they maneuver through the genre and there is a sense in some cases there's a sense that they are maneuvering through a genre that's not theirs right with the novel and in other cases, like the newspaper or the vocabulary, they seize on it and they do what they want with it. And you can, you know, there is a kind of a slight difference that you sense uh, with both. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, I was thinking that, uh, you know, your talk is so fascinating because I've never heard of research oriented the way that yours is. So it brings up a lot of questions and a lot of thinking, particularly in a linguist mind. But uh, I was going to make a comment, and I wanted to get your reaction. Uh, uh, broadening the context uh, with uh, Muslim's comments about Arabic, uh, I was thinking that, uh, of course, a lot of what happened with Cockney in Goa is based on the fact that the Indian state has explicit criteria for recognizing languages. In the Israeli case with Arabic, there seems to be a brute political factor operating, and it's simply raw politics and force that were behind the demotion of Arabic in Israel because there's no other basis for doing it that I can think of or I, that I think anybody else can think of it. But looking at a place like um, Canada is interesting, where you also had the, uh, what should we say, promotion of French as a result of sheer political force of the Francophone majority in Quebec. Okay, and all of the political benefits that came from promoting uh, French beyond English in the beginning. Um, you also have, and this occurred to me, a third situation where you have uh, two official languages in uh, Paraguay in South America. You have Guarani, the indigenous language in uh, 
uh, Spanish. And I just checked that Guarani is still spoken by slightly more than half the people. Okay, so it's more spoken than Spanish. I won't go into all the demographic details. But in spite of that, and in spite of its being the official language, it was only, uh, they only began to use it in instruction in the schools in 1996. And I haven't looked into it, but I would guess that it doesn't have much of an imprint in schooling in Paraguay. So we've got three situations. And the one last thing I wanted to say is about uh, the situation in Quebec. Uh, so many strides were made. When I first started going to Montreal and Quebec City, it was so nice to go someplace where everybody spoke French. Uh, I'll say very quickly, I have this relationship with French. I grew up speaking French, even though I'm an American. French for African-Americans and those who were aware was the language of freedom. That's where you ran away from horrible segregation in the United States to go to a place that was integrated and your talents would be recognized and so on and so forth. So that was our ideation of what French and France were. So I don't want to seem that I'm promoting empire and all the history. <laughs> But the thing is, the last time I went to Montreal, to my shock and horror, <laughs> I could not find anybody to speak French with. <laughs> Asking directions, I came across some construction workers, and the class demographics of French English, I figured that the construction workers would speak French. And the guy said, I don't speak French. <laughs> then I went to bars, restaurants, everywhere. Oh, by, by the way, you do speak French, or I would order in French. And they would say, I know some French, but I don't really use it here with the job. Nobody that I contacted in Montreal during six days spoke French or was willing to speak it. So what I'm talking about is... What has happened with this downfall? I'm going to look it up online and find out what on earth is going on. So language can be promoted. And then several decades later, fall from grace, so to speak. So I would end by saying the status and officiality of language is always in play. And there's a dance of variables, as we used to say, that affect the status and use of language in society. So um, thank you again for your talk, because it certainly raised a lot of questions in my mind and made me think comparatively about other language situations that I'm more familiar with in India. Uh, thank you. If I could just briefly respond, I, I'd say that you know, uh, when you talked about Guarani entering schools in 1996, uh, you know, a newspaper in Devnagri, which was the only script that the Goan state would recognize, the the one newspaper, you, you know, uh, couldn't survive in Devnagri. So they're really, you know, that tells you a lot about what people will instinctively pick up in the morning. So they'll either read, they'll read English or they'll read, um, you know, Marathi or they'll read Konkani. But uh, um, Konkani in Devnagri is not something that they could, even though actually when the state, uh, when, when Konkani became the official language, primary school teachers had to learn Devnagri to teach Devnagri. So they were really in a fix, uh, at least the Catholic school teachers. Uh, but I think even across the board, you know, people may have written in Marathi and spoken in Konkani, but this idea of writing Konkani in the official script actually placed a burden uh, on people. And what you say about the contemporary, it's true. I remember telling someone, oh, you know, should I get my book translated into Konkani? And he said, I don't know what you're talking about. Everybody reads in English. right? So it's also about what people are doing in different languages. So they're accessing, you know, uh, a sort of public prose in English. They'll, you know, they'll, their music may be in Konkani and Portuguese. So it, it's really, it's about tuning into what, uh, to what people are doing at different points in time. Mm -hmm. Yeah.
right. Okay. Uh, we have reached the end of the formal discussion. Um, thank you so much, Prof. Minter, for this really fascinating talk and the lively discussion afterwards. Thank, thank you, you so to our much. audience. Um, Prof. Makuni, I'm not sure if you want to have final comments at this point, or we can just move on to Vishna announcing the next speaker. Uh, let's let's move on to Vishna to announce the next uh, the next talk. Thank you so much for your questions. Thank you.